Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Okay, welcome back to Coast to Coast. Dr. Scott Kulbaba is an internist in private medical practice in Wheaton, Illinois. Graduated from the University of Illinois College of Medicine, honors and did his residency at the Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago and at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He has been awarded membership in the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. He's been featured in the Chicago Magazine as a top doctor in internal medicine, and he's written the book called Physicians Untold Stories. And I got to tell you, Scott, amazing stories indeed. Welcome to the program. Thanks, George. Thank you very much. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about yourself, and then how did you get into writing a book with these kinds of stories, especially with your medical background? How did that transition occur? Well, George, I'm I'm an ordinary doc. You know, when people get sick, they call me up. Yeah. And I just see, uh, I'm a primary care doctor. I take care of all kinds of exciting things like sore throats and diarrhea <laughs> and marital disputes and, and some of the big things, too, like heart attacks and strokes. Oh, yeah. Whatever, you know, you never can tell what comes through the front door. And uh, that's the kind of doctor I am. And I love it. I, I've always wanted to be a doctor. And... Um, actually, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, uh, in the past, I've been relatively boring. You know, you wouldn't want to go to a party with me. I wouldn't know what to say. <laughs> but about five years ago, uh, something happened that was just amazing. And it, it forced me pretty much to, to consider writing a book. And I had more and more experiences uh, like that that eventually led, led to this book. And I'll tell you the, the first one that really changed my life, and sure. that was uh, Dr. Dave Mokel is an orthopedic surgeon locally. I was making rounds, uh, minding my own business, just being an ordinary doc on the floor, and all of a sudden he comes running up to me. He says, Scott, Scott, I've got to tell you this amazing story. And I said, okay, tell me the story. And he said, well, I can't tell you here. He said, why not? He said, someone might hear us. So <laughs> we went into a patient room. He closed the door, and he said, I want to tell you about our mutual patient, Mary. Now, Mary uh, arrested on the, on the operating table when he was doing a surgery on her ankle. Uh, she was given an antibiotic, and evidently that caused her to rest. She had fl she flatlined, no pulse, no respirations, eyes closed, totally, basically dead. When they call a code in the e in the operating room, everyone from the rooms around uh, all of a sudden files in, and um, one of the techs that had uh, bright red hair underneath his uh, operating room cap started to do the CPR chest compressions. Well, Dr. Mokel was in charge of the code, so he was checking the pulse to make sure that you know she was indeed getting a pulse, and she wasn't. So he asked her a couple times, asked him a couple times to step aside so he could do the CPR, and he didn't step aside. Now codes are are life and death situations. You don't have to be real polite when you're running a code. So what he did is he moved over and just pushed him aside and started to do the CPR himself. And they stumbled away, and uh, finally she started to come around. Uh, he was able to do adequate CPR. They gave her some medications, and she then regained her pulse and and uh, came came around, but didn't wake up until the next day. The interesting thing is uh, everyone, you know, after the cardiologist took care of her and so forth, and about two or three days later she was fine, she was going home, and Dr. Mokul stepped into the room and, and said, you know, Mary, uh, I want to, you know, give you some final instructions for going home. And she said, thank you for saving my life. And Dr. Mokul is a humble guy, and he said, well, you know, it was just a, you know, just a team effort. And, and she said, no, no, thank you for saving my life. I saw you push that guy aside and start my CPR. And, and by that point, Dr. Mocha was a little weak in the knees and sat down and said, what, what do you mean? She said, and then she went on to describe all the events that happened in the, in the operating room mm -hmm. today with the CPR. Uh, Dr. Mocha evidently paged me a number of times. I wasn't in the hospital. He kept looking at the door, waiting for me to come and, and uh, help out with the code, but I, again, I wasn't there. And she said, I saw you look at the door multiple times. And she described in detail all the things that had happened during that code that no one could have even told her. And he, he was trying to figure out in his mind, you know, scientifically how this could, could happen. And then she said, my grandmother, who had died uh, many years before, came to me and told me it wasn't my time to go, that I needed to come back. But if I was a kind and good person, 
that there would be a place for me in heaven. And um, uh, it's interesting that, that after, after this code, uh, before that she was, you know, I would say, kind of a curmudgeon. <laughs> yeah. Not the nicest yeah. person in the world. Afterwards, she was phenomenal. She was kind and considerate. She was helpful to her widowed father. Every time I saw her in the office, she was just a wonderfully gentle and, and uh, considerate person. And she lived for about three or four years after that and then finally died because she had multiple uh, uh, serious medical conditions that had been going on all, all along. And so when Dr. Mokul told me that story, I thought, that is incredible. I wonder if other doctors have stories like that. And sure enough, uh, I began to, to, to listen to other doctors' stories, and, and for some reason they, they kept coming to me, and they'd tell me mm-hmm. these amazing stories, and I finally said, I've got to write these down. But they kept them quiet yes. while they were going on, didn't they, generally? Yes. Uh, Dr. Moko, I said uh, to Dr. Moko, did you tell anyone else the story? And he said, no, I just told my family, but I had to tell you because you're the attending. Yeah. And I, I wanted you to know what happened. And, uh, and each of these doctors uh, that told me stories, uh, again, uh, these, these were stories that they don't like to share. These are ordinary doctors. These aren't strange doctors. These are doctors that you go to for, you know, any kind of orthopedic mm-hmm. issue or, or a surgical issue or whatever. And they're afraid to tell these stories because they're so unusual uh, that people would think they're strange and, and stop going to them. At least mm-hmm. that's what they thought. They're afraid of ridicule. and pr- Are they afraid of what some of their colleagues will say about them? I think, uh, I think it's everything. I think their colleagues and I think uh, patients, too. I, I, you know, when you have a, a premonition or a dream or something about a patient and, and it comes true, if you told that if that story was widely circulated, they thought that they would be... Uh, chastised and ridiculed, and they would lose their lose patients. Uh, actually, that hasn't happened, but that was the that was the initial supposition. We're going to talk about a number of stories with Dr. Scott Kowalbaba, author of Physicians Untold Stories, which included 26 other physicians coming forward telling some of the things. And I would guess, Scott, that if you were able to pull the entire planet of doctors, you'd have volumes of stories, don't you think? Yes, yes. And it's interesting, we're getting stories where, where people are writing in stories now all the time, and, and uh, I'm getting enough stories to write a, sec- a second book. Uh, and I think, George, that, you know, th- these are the kinds of stories. I think every family, uh, any, anywhere, not just doctors, but every family has a story like this, so something that you just can't explain uh, scientifically. And I think these stories validate the experiences of virtually every family. I I, I suspect that you or your family have a story uh, that you can't explain, that there's a a vision, something, someone that has passed, that has come back in a certain way uh, to let you know that that they are still around, that they participate in our lives. Uh, Absolutely. I love your last name, by the way. I tried to guess the lineage of that. Are you Albanian? Uh, No, that's uh, Czechoslovakian. Oh, I'm close. (laughs) <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm close. I'm close. How did you get into medicine, Scott? How did that happen for you? You know, I always wanted to be a doc. Uh, I wanted to be a doc since I was, uh, I think, a kindergartner, and I used to. I wrote a paper when I was a kindergartner how, how I wanted to be a doctor, and uh, I got off track sometime in college. I, I majored in economics because uh, some of the classes I didn't think were very interesting, and then I, when I when I finally graduated from. Uh, uh, college, I was delighted that I wouldn't have to ever go to school again. And then after I got into the working uh, world, I realized that I missed my mark and I needed to go back to medical school. It took me a while to do that, but I finally did. And I just love what I do. I just love helping people. Good for I you. love being a doc. I love taking care of the ordinary things of life to help people just uh, have a little easier time in life. Gosh, I remember in the old days, the doctor who delivered me, for example, his name was Dr. Joseph McGough in Detroit. They all used to make house calls. I mean, they used to show up with their big black leather uh, pouch and, you know, yep. they have all mm-hmm. the... What happened to that? Why did that stop? Or uh, I assume it stopped. Yeah. Uh, I still make a few house calls when it's necessary. But the reason it stopped, George, is because uh, what's happened with doctors is, is uh, reimbursement. Um, reimbursement's gone down. Uh, doctors are, are pushed to see more and more patients. And when you have to see 20 or 30 patients a day... You don't have time. To you can't that. drive all over the that's city. What you have to do. For sure. Exactly. You can't and do that's, that. That's, been, well, that's what's happened. Uh, of all these stories we're going to get into tonight, 
Is there a common denominator here on how or why they're happening? Um, I think so. I think, you know, when you write a book like this, uh, and I just assembled a whole group of stories, and, and the criteria I used to, to, uh, to, to include these stories in the book was if this, if this story gave me goosebumps or made me cry, and, and not out of sadness, but out of, of just uh, movement. Uh, of emotion, much, strange uh, emotion, yeah. Emotion, yeah. Then I included the story. So the main, I think the main themes are, and, and, and you know, you never know when you, when you get a group of stories together. And, and finally, I think what happens is a book takes a life of its own. And, and this book is now out of my hands, and it's, and it's got a life of its own. And I think the theme, I think one of the main themes is hope, uh, optimism, and love. I think uh, love, I, uh, uh, I've concluded, is probably the strongest force in the universe. And it's the love of people for each other, and I think it's the love of a, of a force or a god, whatever you want to call it, uh, for us, that has our back, that looks after us, that uh, uh, should give people hope that there's something else out there that, um, that loves us unconditionally and looks out for us and knows us individually. That's the, the, I think that's the theme that emerged from the book. And you, do you find that this power of love, uh, however you want to define it, uh, seems to have been in almost all these cases? I, I think so. I think so. Well, yeah. that's, that's pretty uh, remarkable. And, and, and the love of, of uh, friends, the love of family, uh, uh, I think is, uh, is one of the most powerful forces that supersedes Time, eternity, um, uh, reality—it's—it's um, it's amazing the power of love. And, and the doctors, the of course, of that uh, are part of the book, physicians, untold stories. How again did you find them, or did they find you? You know, a little bit of both. Uh, Dr. Mokul obviously found me, and and uh, uh, the next story that I heard uh, was uh, the doctor found me. But generally, what I what I do would would be. We have a doctor's lounge, and every hospital has a doctor's lounge, and the doctor's lounge is a great hangout place for, for doctors, especially early in the morning, and most doctors are pretty early birds. And I used to hang out in the doctor's lounge about 5.30 in the morning, and we'd have wonderful things there, George, that doctors like to have, like coffee and donuts and, <laughs> and uh, you know, pop and things like that. There's some good things, too, fruit and so forth. But uh, what I do when a doctor would, would come in, I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book, and I committed myself early on uh, so that I would be embarrassed if I actually didn't, didn't carry out the, the, uh, my, my uh, statement. And I'd say, do you have a story that you can think of? And it's interesting that the, when the doctors had a story, they knew it right away, and they'd say, yeah, I've got this incredible story for you. And when they didn't, they would say things like, well, I'll let you know, I'll think about it, and they never, almost never got back to me. But the doctors that had stories uh, uh, would tell me right away. And there were a lot of stories that I heard. Um, and it's amazing how many doctors have incredible stories. But I just included the ones that I thought were really spectacular. And that's, those are the ones that are in the book. Were these game changers for these doctors? Once these stories happened, did they, like, become believers in whatever force was out there? Or did it ever change yeah, them? Yeah. It really did. Uh, a number of doctors said that, that when, they, when they had these experiences, uh, they, they were different people. They became believers, and they became uh, uh, better people for it. But let, me, let me give you a quick example. Yeah. The second story that I heard um, was from Dr. Uh, Heim, who is an orthopedic surgeon, also a trauma surgeon. And uh, this, felt, this, this story came shortly after the Dr. Mokul story. And this is really... This was the straw that kind of broke my back, and, I, and after this story, I said, I've, I've got to write these down. Dr. Heim was skiing in Colorado with his wife and his wife's sister, and they were on an, an unfamiliar mountain, and when they got to the top of the mountain, the blizzard hit, and the temperature dropped, and the wind was coming oh, uh, in all directions, and the snow was so, so, so hard that they could hardly see anything in front of them, but, so they had to ski down, and they started skiing. And they came to this fork in the, in the path, and they had to go to the right or the left. And Dr. Heim went to the right, and the girls went to the left. And as soon as Dr. Heim realized that, he decided to ski back through the, through the, the grove of trees that, that separated the, the girls uh, from himself. And the girls actually were waiting for him, and he knew that they would probably wait. And Dr. Heim's an expert skier, and he was skiing through this five feet of powder snow. And all of a sudden, he got this very strange feeling, and everything became silent and, and very quiet, despite the snow and the wind. 
and he had this feeling that there was something awful, uh, dreadful happening, and, and he didn't know what it was. And he felt like he was being called to do something of life and death proportion, so he stopped skiing. And he didn't know why he stopped skiing. He just stopped in the middle of this woods. The girls are waiting for him. The temperature's dropping. It's, uh, the, the conditions are terrible. He takes off his skis, and then he starts to walk up the mountain in the opposite direction from where the girls are waiting for him. He has no idea why he's doing this. He's walking up, climbing, walking, climbing through this grove of trees, and he comes to a very big pine tree. Now, when there's a, a, a large amount of snow, there's a thing called a tree well where the, where the snow comes down to the base of the, of the tree. It's, it forms like a bowl. And he was standing in front of this big tree, and all of a sudden he realized why he was there when he looked down. There under the tree was a skier, unconscious, oh. looked like he was dead, covered with snow. So he's a trauma surgeon. What better person to, to happen to find a, 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 a skier? He's, he's, he's like an angel to this guy. Exactly. So he brushed off his He knew what to do. He brushed off his face and he looked, you know, looked to see if he was breathing and he looked to see if he was alive. Uh, he had a gray face. He didn't look like he was alive, but he knew what to do. He reached down for his carotid artery in the neck and he had a pulse. It was a thready pulse, but as soon as he felt that pulse, he knew he was alive. He brushed all the snow off, covered him with his jackets. He actually splinted his broken leg uh, since he's an orthopedic surgeon <laughs> with some of his underclothes and a tree branch. And... Um, then he started calling for help. Help, help, he yelled. One of the last skiers down the mountain heard his cry, came to him and said, what can I do? And, and Dr. Heim said, go to the nearest phone, call the ski patrol as soon as you can. This guy's ready, you know, he's, he's shocky, he's unconscious, he's ready to die. We need to get him to a... And I assume they had these little phones everywhere, right? Exactly. So yeah. the guy went down, got to the nearest phone, called. About 20 minutes later, uh, Dr. Heim saw the light from the ski patrol the, on a snowmobile with a gurney that they were pulling they came, loaded the unconscious uh, shocky skier on, on, the, on the gurney, took him down to the lodge where there was an ambulance waiting, took him off to the hospital. Dr. Heim then uh, realized how cold it was, put his jackets back on, went out and, and found the girls who were still waiting for him, interestingly, and then they skied down the mountain, and, and uh, Dr. Heim then got his reward, a cup of hot chocolate. Huh. Uh, the next day, he called the hospital to find out what happened to that guy, and he said he, he lived, he was doing great, uh, he had no serious problems except the broken leg, and the orthopedic surgeons that took care of him were impressed with Dr. Heim's field uh, setting of the leg <laughs> and splinting of it with a tree branch. And so after that, Dr. Heim said to me, you know, you have to believe that there's something else out there, that there's something that you can't see that directs that's right. and participates in our life that, that was involved. And, and that changed his life. That, that changed uh, his, his belief. Uh, beliefs. Scott, do you know if the Dr. Heim uh, ever met the patient again? No, he didn't. He did yeah. not. He found that would, that, that would be fascinating. Like a, it would be. It would be. Uh, you know, uh, many people have asked me when I, when I tell this story, you know, he must have been an important person. He must have been a senator or a, a bishop in a church or something. He was a plumber from, uh, owned a plumbing a contracting business in, in uh, Colorado. He was an ordinary kind of a person, and, um, and, and, and that's interesting because when I did these stories, the people that were saved, the people that, that um, uh, had some miraculous thing happen to them, frequently were just ordinary individuals that weren't anyone, I mean, everyone's a little special, but they weren't, you know, uh, important in, in our society necessarily, uh, which is very interesting. Did they talk about the sexes that uh, were saved more than others, men, women, children, or was it all pretty uniform? No, it's pretty uniform. It's pretty uniform, I think. Yeah, there were men and women that were, were saved and helped by, by these doctors. Uh, Scott, how long did it take you to compile the stories? Uh, George, this started out as a six-month project. You know, I've, I've, uh, I'm a pretty, pretty busy doc, and I thought I can bang this out in six months, and it dragged on to about four, almost four years. Wow! Uh, a lot of this, the writing uh, obviously is is not only writing, but then editing, and oh yeah, uh, you know, the legal legal things, and and there's lots of stuff I discovered in writing a book. This did, is my did, first book. Did you self-publish? I did. I did. Ah. It's interesting, you know, when you're, when you're a new author, uh, unless you're famous, um, you really can't get a book published very, very readily. And so uh, 
Uh, now that we're getting some notoriety with the book, uh, I think other books... Uh, You'll get some other publishers books. approaching you. Yeah, you yeah, I think so. When you put this together, let me ask you if you had a favorite story of the ones that you included in the book. I, I do, uh, and you always have some favorite stories. Um, my, my favorite is, is about a little old grandmother. Uh, her name is Grandma Hanlon. And um, I think that's that's probably my favorite story. Uh, it's about um, uh, Chapter John Five. And his wife Joan. Uh, John Heitzler and, his, and yeah, and his and his wife Joan. Uh, John delivered uh, two of our children, so I'm pretty close to him, and I I know him very well, and I know virtually all these doctors extreme extremely well. And uh, Joan uh, was delivering her uh, fifth child, and uh, went through a, a pretty uh, easy delivery. But afterwards, she was in some pain, and um, uh, there were two gynecologists there because Dr. Heitzler is a gynecologist, and they were, you know, uh, trying to make sure that they did everything correctly with the, you know, their chief gynecologist there. And uh, Grandma Hanlon stepped in the room uh, and literally saved Joan's life. And let me go back and tell you a little bit about Grandma Hanlon. She grew up in Ireland at, at a time when the uh, Irish were having a war between uh, uh, Catholics and Protestants. Her father was Catholic. He was hiding priests in uh, secret rooms in his house, and he realized how dangerous that was, so he sent uh, little Grandma Hanlon uh, to the, this country to, to grow up and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and basically move. And she uh, became a midwife and was kind of the spiritual leader of the whole family. She'd deliver uh, babies she, uh, for, for the uh, uh, Irish and the Irish community in, in uh, Chicago. She would stay with the mother for about six weeks and help out, and sometimes the mother couldn't pay, and she would work for free. And uh, when she'd go downtown, she'd often give the uh, people that were begging on the streets money, and people would laugh at her, and, she, and they'd say, well, why are you giving them money? Because they'll just use it for alcohol. And she said, God would want me to give them uh, some help, and what, what they do with the money is, is up to them. And so uh, she ultimately uh, became older and, and uh, couldn't uh, do any more deliveries, so she moved in with Joan's mother. And um, Joan would, would say that if I could make it to Grandma Hanlon's lap, uh, if I got in trouble with my mom, I'd know I'd be safe. So uh, when Joan was delivering uh, their baby, uh, uh, she started to have some pain after the delivery, and so they decided in those days to use a drug called Trilene, which is administered by mask. So it puts a person, un it makes a person unconscious, basically. So they were starting to uh, give Joan some Trilene, and uh, all of a sudden, Grandma Hanlon stepped into the delivery room, and she was dressed in her typical polka dot, little pink, uh, little blue polka dot dress, uh, grandma, uh, <laughs> little old grandma shoes, her hair up in a bun. She had a, a white sweater vest on, and she stood at the foot of the bed and she shook her head, no, uh, don't, Joan, don't, don't use the Trilene. And so Joan pushed the trialing away, uh, suffered with the, some of the pain. Well, no one knew that, that Joan had eaten a large meal just before she went into labor. And about a minute after she pushed the trialing away, she vomited the entire meal. Oh, had she been unconscious with the mask on, she would have aspirated, and she may have died from that. And, and Joan says uh, that she made it back to Grandma Hanlon's lap one more time, Trans her love uh, for Grandma Hanlon, which was very strong, transcending all time and, and eternity, because Grandma Hanlon had died 20 years before. Oh. Isn't that dramatic how that happens? I've, I've got to tell that you. Was, a, that was a dramatic story. Scott, I've got to tell you a story that uh, somebody had called into the program years ago when I was doing my local show in St. Louis. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, and you're from the Midwest, so you know what happens yeah. in the Midwest. He called up one day and said, George, i got to tell you this story. I was at a point in my life where nothing was working, my job, my relationship. Uh, I was depressed. I, I actually wanted to kill myself. And I'm going, geez, mm -hmm. you hate those calls that come into your show. Uh, I've had a few of people who actually wanted to do it right then. Uh, and thank God we've talked him out of that. But he said, I, I didn't know what to do. So what I did do is I, I got my pistol, my handgun, got in the car, and I drove until I thought I'd find the spot to do it. And I'm thinking to myself, mm -hmm. geez, and he's telling me the story. And obviously he's alive. He's back here telling it to me. So he's okay. 
But he, he said, I found a little tiny lake with ducks kind of, you know, popping in and popping out in a little bench. And I sat on the bench, and that's where I was going to shoot myself because I wanted to go peacefully, but I was, I was done. I was done. And just when I was ready to pull out my gun, some old farmer comes in and sits down next to me. <laughs> And he starts talking and talking about life and about himself, and he would go on and on and on. But he said, the way he did it, I just started feeling good about me and what I could do for myself. And we talked for at least an hour, an hour and a half, mostly him, and I, I just felt good about trying again. So I thanked him, uh, got back in the car, started crying. And went back home, and I ended my relationship, I got a new job, and today I feel great. Well, this is what happened. I decided a year later to go back to that little town and thank that farmer for saving my life. And I didn't get his full name, but I figure, you know, I'll go to the barber. The barber knows everybody. And uh, he went to the barber shop and, the, and he said, excuse me, but I'm looking for this elderly gentleman who looks like this. And, 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 the, and, the, and the, 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 the barber stopped him and said, you might want to go to the top of the hill on the right. There's a white house. Talk to his daughter. And he said, George, the way the barber had talked to me that way, I kind of thought something was wrong. But I did that. I, I went up there. I found the house knocked on the door, and this lady came to the door, and, and I said, uh, Miss, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, thank your father for something he did for me a year ago, uh, and I'd, I'd really love to talk to him. He, he saved my life. And she said, Well, i, I got to stop you right there. You're the fifth person to come up and talk to me about my father saving people. He died 15 wow. years ago. And yeah. like your story, yeah. Scott, they just are chilling, aren't they? They really are. And you know, George, these kinds of things happen all the time, those kinds of things. Um, and I think my, the, the, one of the purposes of my book is to have people realize that look for these things in your life. Look for these things in the lives of other people and count on these things. Count on thing, miraculous things happening to you. Someone upstairs, uh, whatever you want to call it, some force, some some uh, 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 creator, most of my doctors call it God, uh, is looking out for us. And, and have hope. Be optimistic. Uh, he or she wants you to, to be a success and, and wants you to, to do some great things. And that's, that's I think, one of the, the themes of, of the book. And that, that story that you told, it, it does give you goosebumps. Yeah. And, and that happens to lots of people. Your major one of your major t feelings in the book has to do with uh, coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. Yeah. I believe that everything has a purpose. That fate takes over. But tell me your definition of that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of coincidences. There are some coincidences that are just coincidental, obviously. But I think there are some coincidences that just uh, you, you can't you can't. Uh, deny that there's something behind that. There's some force. There's some creator or some, some someone, something's happening. Out Somebody's us. doing something. Yeah. L let me tell you a little story about what happened to me personally. Um, I graduated from college and was trying to get into medical school, and I wasn't the greatest student in college because I had changed my major to economics, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't dedicated at the, at the time. But after I graduated, I became, you know, uh, a student on fire. I wanted to become a doctor, and I knew I had to, to do some things before I could do that. Yeah. One of the things I had to do was take organic chemistry. Now, organic chemistry was only offered in two schools at night. I was working during the day, and this was the, you know, I, I'd been trying to get into medical school for a couple of years, and I, I didn't do it. This, I, I said, this is the last year. If I don't get in now, I've got to get a real job and, and get on with my life. And so I enrolled in organic chemistry at Aurora University where I was working. It was perfect. And I went to the bookstore and got a, got a book. There were tons of books in the bookstore. And I went to the first class, and when I went to the class, there were only three students there, and I thought, oh, this is great because I'll be able to, uh, you know, get real uh, uh, personal care uh, from the uh, professor. 
the professor walked in and said, I've got bad news. We're canceling the class. There aren't enough students. So I rushed <laughs> down the next day to Roosevelt University, which is downtown Chicago, about 70 miles from where I was living. And I, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to enroll in organic chemistry there because that was the other uh, school that had organic chemistry at night. So I got in line, waited for the registrar, and got to the front of the line, and I said, I'm, I'd like to enroll in organic chemistry. And, uh, and the, the person there said, well, I'm sorry, we have one class that's filled. We have opened up a second class that's filled, and we have 10 other students that are trying to, on the waiting list to get in. And I said, well, you don't understand. If I don't get into medical school, I'll be a failure in life, and I need to you know, get into organic chemistry. And she said, I'm very sorry. Everyone on the waiting list has the same story that you do. And so I said, well, who can I talk to? about getting into medical, you know, getting into organic chemistry. And she said, the only person that can make that decision is the professor. I said, well, where's the professor? And she said, room 302. So I ran upstairs, stumbling on the way, and I got to a room that was filled with students, all trying to do the same thing I, I was doing. And so I said to the, uh, the secretary, you know, I just need a couple minutes with the professor. And I must have looked like such a sad sap that she said, okay, why don't you wait in the ante room outside the door? The two professors are talking right now. So I'm waiting out there, and the door is paper thin, and I didn't intend to listen, but I, I could hear what was going on inside. And one professor was saying, it's really terrible. We've got a whole class. We have no books. We've called the, we've called the uh, publisher. We've called all the schools in the area. There are no organic chemistry books, and I don't know what we're going to do with the class that starts tomorrow with no books. And they're talking about this. And, and you need books for organic chemistry, because that's not an easy course. Oh, for sure. No, no, for sure. That, that is a killer course. And so I stepped in and I said to the professor, listen, I'm, you know, I, I, I know that the book, the, the class is filled, but I've got to get into organic chemistry, otherwise I'll be a failure in life and so forth. And he looked pretty bored and, and he said, I'm sorry, uh, you know, the, the class is filled. We have 10 on the waiting list and uh, we just can't accommodate you. And he shook my hand and, and, and saw me out. And I said, uh, then I, you know, I realized this is a desperate situation and he called for desperate, desperate measures. And I said, if I can get you books, will you let me in? And by this time, my heart was pounding in my, in my, my neck mm-hmm. you know, because this was my life flashing in front of me. Sure. Right the, all, of a sudden, all of a sudden, his eyebrows went up, and I could tell he, he became a little more interested in what I was talking about. He said, can you get me 30? And my heart was now in my throat. And I said to him, more. And there was a long silence. It was like, you know, uh, uh, it was like hours and hours of silence. Mm-hmm. He said, Felt like that. you're in. Yeah, so I got into the class, and I told them where the books were. They got the books. Everything was a success, and I, I, I enrolled in the class, and, and that got me started, and I got into medical school because of that. And here you now, are today. The inter- interesting thing is, how, what do you, the coincidence that I would be outside that room at the very time that they were talking about something that only I could help them with and only they could help me with is, is beyond coincidental. See, that, that's, that's why I say there are no coincidences, because what you just experienced, I think you, you were destined for that to happen by some force. Something exactly. made that happen for you. And I believe that, too. You know, I didn't believe it until I wrote this book. I thought this was a coincidence until I wrote this book. And then when I, when I got, got some of the doctor's stories, I realized that wasn't a coincidence. There was something that's right. that wanted me to become a doctor. And... <laughs> my goal in this book was to get people to realize, and, and people are, they're writing me and saying, I, I now realize that the coincidences that I thought I had were more than that. They were some divine intervention. And that's cool to get those letters and, and those emails from people that, to say that, you know, they realize now that their life is, is um, uh, special and, and that they, they've been directed to a certain good goal that they've been trying to do. And, and that's really fun for me to get those letters. You had one of the doctors talked about a fluttering light or a dream. What was that story? Yeah, Noemi Sigalov is a, uh, uh, a surgeon, and uh, she, uh, when she was in residency, and, that, and the surgical residencies are really, really tough, and they take care of some really sick people. These are gunshot wounds, and these are, oh, you know... High trauma, trauma, right? Car accidents and yeah. so forth. High trauma, big, big-time trauma. So people are are dying all the time just because they're so sick and and you know they do everything they can but you know sometimes you just can't do everything so uh, she would have an uncanny sensation when a, when a person was going to die and she would have a fluttering light uh, on the side of her vision and uh, when she had that she knew uh, that someone was going to die in their on their service that day and and 
when she would when she would make rounds with other residents, and she told them that you know that this morning she had this this sensation, they would all groan because they knew that something bad was going to happen. And sure enough, uh, virtually every time that ha- that happened, uh, there was someone that died in the service. And so she doesn't know why that happened. Uh, it, it, after her residency, it went away. She hasn't had it since. She's had some interesting experiences since, but uh, nothing like that. So she can't explain it. Uh, but but you know there's there's something else out there that that uh, guides us and, and leads us. Out. What do you think that is, Scott? What do you think is guiding us? I, Scott, I agree with you. There's something there. There's a power. There's a force. Uh, I've always called it to the wireless internet where we're all connected. But what do you think's out there doing this? Well, personally, I think there's a there's a God, and I think there's a there's a God that loves us that uh, participates in our life more than we realize, and, and that these coincidences are, are related to that. Other doctors would call it a force, the uh, uh, universe, whatever. But uh, I think there's something out there that's higher than us. I think there's a, there's a force, there's a God higher than us that loves us unconditionally. And again, this theme of love. And uh, when, when we think that there's no hope, um, I think if we have knowledge that there is something else out there, that gives us the hope to, to go on, like uh, like many of the doctors in, in, in this book. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.